Jabari Jumps by Gaia Cornwall. I'm jumping off the diving board today, Jabari told his dad. Really? said his dad. Jabari watched the other kids climb the long ladder. They walked all the way out to the end of the board as big as tiny bugs. Then they stood on the edge, they spread their arms and they bent their knees and they sprang up, up, up. And then they dove down, down, down. Splash! Looks easy, Jabari said. And when his dad squeezed his hand, Jabari squeezed back. Jabari stood at the bottom of the ladder. He looked up. You can go before me if you want, he told the kid behind him. I need to think about what special kind of jump I'm going to do. Jabari thought and thought. Jabari started to climb up and up. This ladder was very tall, he thought. Are you okay? called his dad. Just a little bit tired, said Jabari. Maybe you should climb down and take a tiny rest, said his dad. A tiny rest sounded like a good idea. When he got to the bottom, Jabari remembered something. I forgot to do my stretches, he said to his dad. Stretching is very important, said his dad. I think tomorrow might be a better day for jumping, Jabari said. They looked up at the diving board together. It's okay to feel a little bit scared, said dad. Sometimes, if I feel a little bit scared, I take a deep breath and I tell myself, I am ready. And you know what? Sometimes it stops me feeling so scared and feels a little bit like a surprise. Jabari loved surprises. Jabari took a deep breath and felt it fill his body from the ends of his hair right down to the tips of his toes. Jabari looked up. He began to climb up and up and up and up until he got to the top. Jabari stood up straight. He walked all the way to the end of the board. His toes curled around the rough edge. Jabari looked out as far as he could see. He felt like he was ready. I love surprises, he whispered. He took a deep breath and spread his arms and bent his knees. Then he sprang up, up off the board, flying. Jabari hit the water with a splash. Down, down, down he went and then back up. Whoosh! Jabari, you did it, said his dad. I did it, said Jabari. I'm a great jumper. And you know what? What, said dad. Surprise double backflip is next. Hi. So today we are going to have a look at verbs. Uh, what a verb is, what a verb does. And then we will have a look at seeing if we can identify some and use them in our sentences. Now, the story that I read this week is called Jabari Jumps. It's a lovely little story about being brave. If you haven't watched it, go and watch it. Um, and I'm going to start by saying there is a verb in the title of that story. The word jumps is a verb because verbs are doing or being word. So a verb is a doing or being word. And in this case, the verb is jump. Jump is something that I can do. I wonder if we can think of some other things that we can do. I'm going to write the word jump down. Oh, at the moment I am talking. So I can write the word talk down. I can also use the word sing. I could use the word brush. If I was in the kitchen, then I might chop or stir, or bake, well done. What about if I was outside? I might kick a ball, I might kick, I might climb, I might run, I might skip. Oh, you're getting good at this. Let's play a game. I challenge you to 30 seconds worth of time to write as many verbs as you can down. And then at the end of the 30 seconds, I will read out all the verbs that I have on my board. And if they're on your board, you have to cross them out. And if they're not, then you can have a point for each one that you're left with. See if you can get any points. So the idea is to be as obscure as you can. So think of things that you can do. Are you ready? Let's go. I'm gonna add some more onto my board. I've got some there already. 
um, but I am going to add some more onto my board too while you do yours and then I will read them out and we'll see whether or not you've got them or whether you had some different ones. If you had some different ones, that's brilliant. Um, okay, we are nearly up. 30 seconds goes so quick. Okay, time is up. Okay, let's see whether you had any of the same. I had jump, talk, sing, brush, chop, stir, bake, kick, climb, run, skip, shout, teach, learn, type, fish. The word fish is a weird one because it can also be used as a noun. It can also be the name of an animal, but I can also go and fish, so it can be a verb as well. Did you manage to get any? Well done! Great job! So verbs are things that we do. Now, in a sentence, a sentence always needs a who and a what. The what is the verb. So when we're looking for the what in a sentence, we're looking for the verb in a sentence, or if we're looking for a verb, we're looking for the what in a sentence. We can use it either way around to help us, but that is indeed the case. So if we said the kangaroo jump, we've got a who, the kangaroo, and a what, he jumped. So the jumped is the verb. Now, verbs can take lots of different forms. So in that sentence, the, the um, kangaroo jumped. He'd already done it, he did it in the past. So that one ended in ed. There are lots of verbs that don't fit into that. Um, like we wouldn't say he swimmed, we would say swam. So there are lots of verbs that don't fit into that pattern. But generally, if there is a verb that ends ed, it means it happened in the past. And if it ends in ing, it generally means that it's happening now. So either now in the story, if we're reading the story, or now as in right now, I am talking. It can be either. So let's see if we can write a sentence using the verb. Let's use the word well, let's not use the word sing because that's a tricky one. It doesn't become singed, it becomes sang. Um, let's use the word walk and let's see if we can write two sentences. One that's happening right now and one that happened in the past. I'll give you a minute or so and I'm going to write on two. So we're looking for one sentence with the, word, with the verb walk, but where it happened in the past and one where it's happening now. Yeah, well done. And then one where it already happened. In actual fact, I'm going to use a really similar sentence to just change it so that it's in the present and past tense. So, I am walking to the shop. I'm doing it right now. I walked to the shop. So, I am walking is a little verb phrase. I do indeed actually need the am there because I couldn't say I walk into the shop. That wouldn't make any sense. And then I walked to the shop fits perfectly with the ed. Let's see then if we can come up with five verbs and we'll see if we can put them into the past tense so they already happened and put them into the present tense so that they are happening now. We might need the um, verb are or am to go before it for the it's happening now like I am walking am walking was my verb phrase so I'm going to use the verbs stir kick jump like Jabari and climb because he climbed in the story too so can we turn them so they happened in the past Yeah, well done, exactly. We can add ED onto the end. And what about if they were happening right now? So, yeah, I am stirring, I am kicking, 
I am jumping. I am climbing. Yeah, absolutely. Well done. So sometimes with those verbs, we need to use am or are or were. If we're talking about um, a group of people, they were doing this. In which case, that's not talking about it happening right now, but it is talking about it being a present thing. So it's not happening now. It already happened, but they're telling you what they did. So they were kicking the ball when it flew over the wall. So they were kicking it and then it flew over the wall. Whereas I might say they kicked the ball over the wall. I could use either, either would work. Let's see then if we can pick out the verbs from some sentences and if we can come up with, if we can work out where the mistakes are in the sentences too. Let's start by seeing if we can pick out some verbs in some sentences. So let's go for Jabari climbed the big ladder and jumped off the end. So Jabari climbed the big ladder. Well done. Jabari climbed the big ladder and jumped off the end. Yeah. Well done. And then can you draw a line under the verbs? How many verbs are there? Well done. There are two there. The word climbed and the word jumped. They are the two things that Jabari did. Well done. See if you can write me another sentence that has two verbs in it and I will write a sentence myself hopefully as beautifully as you write yours um well done Have you managed to get two in there? Okay. Let's have a look at my sentence and see. I think I might have made some mistakes. Dad hugged Jabari after he jumping off the ladder. Ah, oh, hang on. A sentence always needs to start with what? Exactly. A sentence always needs to start with a capital letter. So there's one mistake. And what type of sentence did I write? Dad hugged Jabari after he jumping off the ladder. Is it a question? Because that there is a question mark. So if I'm not asking a question, I don't need a question mark. This is a statement. I'm telling you that's what Dad did. So it needs a full stop at the end of it. Okay, and now there's one more mistake. Dad hugged Jabari after he jumping off the ladder. Right. This is in the past. He hugged after he jumped. So we don't need the ing on the end of jump because the verb is, is to jump. We don't need the ing on the end though. So we get rid of that and instead it should read he jumped off the ladder. So dad hugged Jabari after he jumped off the ladder. That looks more like it, doesn't it? What about then if the sentence looked like this? So, so my sentence is about those children and this is a bit trickier, but let's see if we can work out where my mistake is the children are shouting when Jabari got to the top. The children are shouting when Jabari got to the top. They are shouting when he got to the top. They don't match, do they, look? So the children are shouting is in the present tense. They're doing that right now. But when Jabari got to the top, 
when he got is in the past tense. So I need to change this one of two ways. Either I can change this to say that the children were shouting when Jabari got to the top, or I can change this to say the children are shouting when Jabari gets to the top. So it doesn't matter which one I change. I'm going to change the first one just because I know that the word were will definitely fit in there. It doesn't matter which one I change as long as my verbs in my sentence agree. So I can't have one in the past and one in the present. They both have to be in agreement. So they both have to be in the past or they both have to be in the present tense within my sentences. So the children were shouting when Jabari got to the top. They were shouting. It's what they were doing when he got to the top. They're both therefore in the past tense. So verbs doing or being words and they're generally that what in our sentence makes them a bit easier to spot and it's super important that they agree so that if you start your sentence in the past then the whole sentence is in the past if you start your sentence in the present tense then the whole sentence is in the present tense and your verbs agree with each other that's tricky but you did a really great job whatever you do with the rest of your day have a great one bye bye hi so today we are going to look uh this absolutely we are going to look at adding uh, other words for adding adding addition uh, count on more than greater than some total all mean the same thing though we're going to put this and this together um, and today we are specifically going to look at adding a one digit number so any number from one to nine onto a two digit number, one that has tens and ones. And what we're going to do is we are going to explore multiple different ways that we could do this. Um, some of them physical, practical, mental, and some of them written methods that we can use. All are really good practice. We could use stuff if we wanted to so we could use pasta or stones or beads or anything and we could count out the number that we need and we could add it on so my example for that would be if I was going to do 21 and 3 I wouldn't count out all of them I would count out three and then I would start at 21 and I would count on so 21 22 23 24 21 add three equals 24 so if you know that when you're adding you still like to have something physical then you could do it with stuff or you can do it with your fingers obviously because we're adding one digit numbers on you only need nine fingers to be able to do that um, same as if you were using stuff, you would only ever need nine things if we're adding single digit numbers on. And both of those are absolutely fine. So, for example, we could add anything. We could add 82 and four. We would need four, either four fingers or four stones or whatever it is. We just need the four because we are going to start at 84 and count on. So what comes after 84? 85, 86, 87, 88. So 84 add 4 equals 88. It doesn't matter how big that first number is. If I am adding a one digit number onto it, I can use my fingers or I can use my manipulatives. I can use my things um, because I only need nine of them. But I certainly don't need to count out 84 stones and then add four more to it. I just count on from there. Counting on is a really good way of doing it. And one of the methods, one of the written methods that we are going to look at is basically just showing how that works in your head because it's called using a number line. So let's try with the number 52 and we will add five to it. So I wrote my number sentence down, 52 add five equals. And remember equals just means is the same as. So this on this side is the same as whatever we work it out to be on this side. To use an empty number line, I am going to draw the line and I'm going to put my big number, my first number, at the beginning. Now, with adding, 
I would always put the biggest number first because it means you have to do the least amount of counting on. So in this case, 52 is going to go at the beginning of my number line. And then I am trying to add on five. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw five little jumps. So one, two, three, four, five. Now it doesn't matter how big or small these are. The best way to do it is to come all the way down to the line like these ones here do. Um, because it gives you something to count towards. You certainly can't do it if you just do this at the top because you won't be able to work out where the jumps are. And it also is better if they are a little bit bigger rather than being teeny, teeny, tiny because you do need to be able to see them in order to count them. So once we've done our five jumps, we are then going to use those jumps to count on exactly like we would have done with our fingers or our pens or our stones or whatever we were using. So here we go, look, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57. So I can write it down here on my number line so that I don't forget it, but in actual fact, I can also write it here as my answer. Now, the reason that I get into the habit of writing it here at the end of the number line is that I can also use a number line for other things. And if I'm using it to add on a two digit number to a two digit number, then I need to remember to do it in sections. And if I'm using it to add on three single digit numbers, then I need to remember to do it in sections. So for me, that's the easiest way to do it. And then I just put the number up there as well. I just write it twice. So we can add a single digit number on by using a number line. Let's do one more of those. Um, because I do think that is a good way of doing it. It's a nice visual representation of what it is that goes on inside our heads if we do counting on using our fingers. And a written method is always a good thing to have because we can see where we're going wrong. If we do something and it's not quite right, then we can work out where we're going wrong. Whereas if we're just counting on our fingers, we could do the same thing again and again and again and just get really frustrated and not work out where our mistakes are. So sometimes that's really handy to be able to see it written down on paper. It's much easier to find where our mistakes are. So let's have a go together at doing 79 add, we'll do eight this time, 79 add eight. So if you are joining in, you need that empty number line and you need the number 79 at the end of it, at the left hand side of it. And then we're going to go that way because we are adding on and we need to add on eight. So 79. Why do I, I don't need 79. I need eight. Right, you ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There we go. Now, in an ideal world, I would come all the way down to the line. But as long as I have something that is, for me, big enough to put my finger in or big enough to put the pencil in, then I can use those to count on. So 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87. So at the bottom of the number line, I'm going to write 87 in and I will also write it on the other side of the equals. So 87 goes here. Now, by putting a dot in each of the ones that I counted, if my answer was not right, I might be able to work out where I had missed one. Let me give you an example of a number line that is not quite right, and we'll see if we can work out where I go wrong. So you can have a go at doing it, at doing the number line, and then we'll have a look at my incorrect answer and see if we can work out where I went wrong together. So let's do 54 and 9. So we do 54 add 9. So remember, draw that empty number line. 54 at the one end and then you need 9 jumps. And then you need to start at 54 and count on using each jump as one number and then put your answer at the bottom and after the equal sign. Now hopefully you don't have the same answer as me because mine is wrong. Can we work out why mine is wrong though? Yeah, well done. If we count the jumps, one, two, 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are only eight jumps, and how many jumps should there be? Yeah, there should be nine. So all I need to do is add one more jump on, and then in actual fact, I'm not going to recount because I know that one more than 62 is 63. So I've left all of that there. I've added it on to the end, and I've put the 63 in. I've just changed this one here because all of this is still right. That was 62 there, but it's now 63 there, and then I can continue on. So we can correct a mistake quite easily using um, an empty number line. But there is another way that we can add numbers together. So we can use what we call a column method of adding to add um, numbers together. Now, what this relies on is you remembering the place value of each of these numbers. Really, really important. So if I show you that the number that I'm going to add together is I'm going to do 14 and I'm going to add five to it. So this number has tens and ones and this number only has ones. So when I put them on my board in, a, in, in columns underneath each other to add together, what I have to remember is that this number here doesn't have any tens. So I don't, I need to make sure that I put this here. And what I could do, because it doesn't alter my number at all, if I need something to make sure that they all line up nicely, what I could do is I could put a zero in front of my five. So putting a zero in front of it does not change my number at all. It just means zero five. So it just means five, but it might help me with my placement. And then what I do is I add up my columns. So I've got four, and five, and I always start with my ones. Um, always start with my ones, so these ones here, and then work this way. So four and five, so that's nine. So I need to make sure that my nine goes underneath it. And then one and zero, one, again, making sure that it's underneath. So 14 add five equals 19. Now I needn't write it like this and this, I can just write it like this, and that would be my answer. I just wanted to show that the two numbers were different. So let's do another example of that together. Now, if you want to put the zero in to hold the place, because that is all a zero does anywhere in a number. So we can use it at the beginning if we need to, to hold the place. If you want to do that, then that's absolutely fine. It won't hurt, it won't change the answer at all. So let's go for 32, and this time we will add six. So 32, and we are going to add six. So remember, 32 has tens and ones, and six only has ones. So the six needs to go beneath the two. So it should look like this. Or maybe like this, if you use it zero as a placeholder. As long as you don't get confused and turn it into 60, then that's absolutely fine. Um, it is, of course, quicker to do it without the placeholder if you're doing more numbers. Uh, and then we start here. We always start with our ones. So two and six is eight. So the eight goes underneath that. And then three and zero is my other one. Well, if I'm not adding anything to it, then three. There we go. Okay, let's do one more. You can do it and I'll do it and get it wrong. And we can see if we can work out where I go wrong. So let's do the number 55 and we will add three to 55. 55, add three. It's also important to remember to put the add at the side so that we remember that that's what we were doing because we could always also use the column method for taking away for subtraction. So just putting the little add sign there um, does help. Okay, are you ready? Oh, my answer looks different to your answers. because I forgot about the place value of my digits, absolutely. This is three, not 30, so it can't go underneath here. Three goes here. And then in actual fact, if the three were there, I'll do it at the side of it as another example so that we can compare the two. 
if the three were there, then in actual fact, they would flip completely because I've got five tens and I've got eight ones left. So it is super important that we get the placement of those right. A, because it means that we can make mistakes when we are doing um, like the adding here. But also if we were to use the column addition method to add more than two numbers together, which we can do, then we would very quickly fall into the realms of it being particularly difficult. So it being neat and clear is really important for that. Um, but we can use any of the other methods that we use today too. I think you've done a super job. We did some really great adding in lots of different ways. And all of those different ways are absolutely fine. We can use any of them when we are adding a one digit number onto a two digit number. Whatever you do with the rest of your day, have a great one. Bye. Hi. Today we are going to do some learning about water displacement. We're going to look at floating and sinking and we are going to try and make our very own boat. Now, the easiest way to do this is out of foil because it's really easy to um, manipulate and change the shape. So you just need some foil and then some, I'm using baking beans because they're the only things that I have, but I guess you could use peas or pasta or anything that, um, or marbles, anything that you can use to sort of put inside it where they're all a similar size and shape and weight because that's what we're looking for. To make it a fair experiment, we are going to want to use something that is the same so that we can then count how many the boat took before it sank. So some things sink and some things float. So some things stay on the top and some things sink to the bottom. That's because they're made up of molecules that are either tightly packed together or loosely packed together. If they're tightly packed together, then the material is dense, the object is dense and it will sink. If they're loosely packed together, then the object has a low density and it will float. But some things, like ships, which is kind of what this reminded me of, um, will float even though they're huge and heavy and very dense. The reason for that is to do with water displacement. So my little boat here that I didn't actually make will stay floating on the top of the container while the amount of water that it moves to the sides is less than the weight of the object. As soon as I start adding things to it, it will start to sink lower and lower into the water and eventually the last one will be too much and it will take on water and it will sink to the bottom. And this is taking quite a lot to do that. You can see that it is sinking lower and lower into the water though. I was trying really hard to level it out so that I wasn't putting all of them on the same side. Oh, but you can see there it is, look. That is it on the bottom. So my tiny, tiny, it was the candle, the home for the candle really, rather than a boat. But that one took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I wonder if we could make a boat that could stay afloat for more than ten. Do you think it would need to be bigger? Do you think it needs high walls? Do you think it needs low walls? Remember, when we talk about displacement, that's the water that is pushed out. So when I put my hand in, you can see that the level of the water rises because my hand is heavy. So the boat can displace a certain amount of water. We don't want it to come over the side of the container either, but that's not what would happen. What happens is that it displaces the water and it pushes it out and then the boat will sink further and further down and then the water will come in. And once the water comes in, we know that then it will sink. So I am going to use a piece of foil and I'm going to mould it into the shape of a boat. 
Maybe I can do it like um like a canoe. I'm just gonna move the water out of the way so I've got a little bit of room to work. But I think I'm going to fold up the sides and then make a nose at the front because I've seen that on a boat. Um and then I think that it's quite important for whatever the boat I make to have quite high sides and also to make sure that it is completely watertight. So there was a cut just there. So I obviously need to, um, there we go, go past that. And then I also need to fold in my corners as well so that they, Okay, I'm just going to work on the end of mine. And you can make your own boat. Maybe you could make more than one boat and maybe you could change the style of the boat. Okay, look, so it's got a nose at the front, it's got a flat back, it's got high walls. I couldn't really make a boat that's much bigger than that because it wouldn't, it wouldn't float. But in terms of the size of this in comparison to this obviously is significantly bigger. So let's start our experiment by using my boat. And the question that we asked was, can we make a boat that floats for more than 10 beams? Because that's what the other one floated for. So to start with, it does float. Good, because that would have been embarrassing. So let's start with these 10 beads to start with that we already had on the other one. Now, I think logically this boat that I've made must hold more than 10 beans. Yeah, there we go. There's our 10 beans in already. Why do I logically think that it must hold more than 10 beans if we look at this one in comparison to that one that held 10? Yeah, purely because of the size of it. However, if I'd have made it really flat, then it would have started to, it would have displaced the water over the top of the sides and it would have taken water in already. So the fact that I made it with high sides, I think also helps. But let's see, so we were at 10 so far. So 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. Oh my goodness. 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. Can you see though that the where it sits in the water is definitely changing? You can see that some of the boat is now underneath the water while some of the boat is still, lots of the boat is still on, on the top of the water, but it is definitely sitting heavier in the water than it was before but that's with 50 baking beans in and they're quite heavy i'm quite impressed with that let's see whether or not we can carry on and make it sink with a few more so 51 52 53 54 55 56 50, 57 58 59 60 61 62 63 64 65 or i think i know how this is going to sink but let's get to 70 66 67, 68, 69, 70. I think I know how this is going to sink because the way that I've made it, the boat has become a little bit lopsided. So when I put the beans in, it's they're always going to one side. I'm not sure whether or not you can see that this side here is lower than this side here. That's why you can see this side is, low, is down in the water, but then this side over here is quite high. So I could try really hard to place some beans over this side and maybe that would help to even it out. Um, maybe an even load is quite important on both sides of something that's big. I'm not sure, but at the moment we have 70 in there already. Quite a lot. 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80. 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90. Wow, can you see now how low that's set in the water? So the water line is coming further and further up. So I think that I made a boat here that could quite easily hold 
100 beans because that would only be 10 more let's just prove that and then we'll see if we can make a boat that can hold less but more than the first one so somewhere in between 10 and 100 so 91 92 93 94 95 96 97 98 99 100 yeah at 100 it is still afloat it is actually significantly lower on this your side than it is the other that's why that side is up it would eventually it would capsize and that's because of a weight imbalance rather than um the water displacement so we would need it to be even and when it is even you can see that this proportion of it here is all underneath the water now and it's only this top section here that is on the top of the water so okay with high sides we can make a successful boat those are the two that i missed with so this one held 10 and the huge one held 100 so how would i make a boat to hold 30 it would need to be a bit smaller yeah absolutely so let's go for something that's a bit smaller okay so i'm still going to go for a similar idea in that i'm going to make it have high walls because i think that was something that was really useful before so i'm making it a lot smaller than it was before but still with high walls um and still with a flat bottom because i think that was particularly helpful before too so we're nearly there look it's got a flat bottom i just need to curl these these corners there we go that's why using foil is so good for an experiment like this because it's just so easy to move around but obviously ask a grown-up before you just start using it because they might not be very happy with you you can do it with other things as well and um, if you were to make a boat out of paper then it would be a great boat initially oh no that's not a great boat look at that <laughs> It would be a great boat initially, but then it would very quickly, it would take on water and it would sink because the because what the tinfoil is, in terms of a property of a material, the tinfoil is waterproof, where paper is not. Paper is absorbent. Right, let's try again. I've just covered the whole thing in, I've just covered the whole thing to get rid of the hole. Oh dear. That might not be ideal, but we'll see. So this one is a bit bigger and our aim is 30 beans. Well, I'll use the beans out of here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now I can already see that this is going lower in the water. Oh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. And the problem is that this side wall here, this side wall here is too bulky. I think I got to 19, didn't I? 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 20, no, 22 at the most. I'll count them again because I am... Um, I got distracted by the sidewalls being heavy. Uh, also, yeah, that's an issue for it as well. I don't think I sealed the hole particularly brilliantly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. So I reckon that a boat this size was probably the right sort of size with high walls and things. But if I wring it out, there's water inside it. So part of the issue was that um, my cover up job wasn't very good. So we can make a boat to hold what we need. And as long as its base is big enough that they can spread out and it has high walls, then we'll be fine until the water that it needs to push out of the way in order to stay put comes up over the edge so the water displacement is that when my boat sits on the top it has to push the water out of the way can you see the change look in the water level so there's the water level and then i put my boat in and the water level rises because it's pushing it out of the way and so my boat will be fine with weight until it has to push too much water out and then it will take on the water and it will sink to the bottom 
And obviously, if it gets a hole, that is game over. I think we did some really good experimenting there. And some really good learning about water displacement. I am now off to pick up all the little beans off the floor. But whatever you do with the rest of your day, have a brilliant one. Bye bye. Hello, angel students. Today I would like to share a story with you about a bird named Pip. Pip was a very happy bird. Pip was always singing and chirping beautiful melodies. Such beautiful melodies that it made other people happy in turn when they woke up and they heard the beautiful, happy, cheerful sounds of Pip singing and chirping. It was just one of those things that brought pure joy, sheer and utter joy, excitement, love, pure kindness. It was just a cheerful sound to hear on a daily basis and everybody enjoyed hearing it. It was a familiar sound, you know, something that people got used to hearing. Everybody got used to hearing Pip's cheerful sound and everybody loved it. It was something that brought about peace and just a lovely vibe throughout the day. It seemed to really resonate with people. It seemed to be really contagious, that happy, chirpy, wonderful feeling that just set the entire tone for the rest of the day. But then one morning, Pip woke up and just felt sad, had a heavy, sad feeling. And because of that feeling, Pip didn't much feel like singing on this particular day. So there was no singing, there was no chirping, there was no melody. And Pip didn't even understand himself why he felt that way, why he didn't feel like singing. He just knew today he didn't feel like singing. And as much as Pip tried to shake it off and get rid of that feeling, it just wasn't working. There wasn't anything that he could do to shake that feeling of sadness off of him. So instead of focusing on singing and all of the things that were familiar to Pip, Pip decided to just go and fly, just to have a fly around and see if maybe that would help him to feel better, give him a bit of space, spread his wings and get a little bit of exercise in there at the same time. So whilst Pip decided to focus on flying instead of singing, I mean, he is a bird, so of course he's gonna fly, why not? It's the perfect thing to do. So Pip takes off soaring through the skies and he's flying through the forest, watching all of nature's beauty. And as he's soaring through, he notices an owl, a very wise and very old owl. And this owl is perched on the branch of a tree. So as Pip begins to slow down, as he notices the very wise and very old owl, the owl too notices Pip. But the owl doesn't just notice Pip. He notices that Pip isn't his usual self. Pip isn't his usual singing, chirpy, happy self. And that concerns the owl. So he beckons to him to come closer so they can have a conversation. And as Pip lands very close to the same branch as the owl, the owl asks, what's wrong? I don't know, said Pip. I honestly can't figure it out. I woke up this morning and I just felt sad. I didn't feel like singing, I didn't feel like chirping, I didn't feel like doing anything really. And I've tried to shrug this feeling off, but it just doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Pip continues to tell the owl that he tried many different ways to try to shrug off this feeling. But since he's woken up, it's how he has felt. And so because none of those things were working, he decided that he was going to take off and have a fly. And that's why he's here now. And listening in itself is an extremely skilled thing to be able to do. And the owl let Pip speak and listened patiently and carefully until he had finished. And once the owl was clear that Pip had finished speaking, he said, Pip, it's okay to feel sadness sometimes. It's perfectly normal, in fact. We all have our ups and downs. We all have our good days and we all have our bad days. The important thing to remember is that it will pass. It is just 
passing, like the night passes. And then in the morning, the sun comes out. It is important to remember that sadness is just a passing feeling. It's just stopping over for a little while and soon it will be gone. Pip thought about what the old wise owl had said and it made sense to him. It slowly started to make him feel better, in fact, knowing that the sadness won't last very long. And eventually, like a night, it will pass and the sunshine will come again. So he thanked the owl for his time and his kind and wise words of encouragement and decided to continue flying as he had set out to do to feel better. So as he was flying, he decided, even though he didn't really feel like it, even though it wasn't really something he wanted to specifically do in that particular moment, that he was gonna sing. He was gonna sing anyway whilst he was flying through the forest. And would you believe, whilst he flew and began to sing, the rest of the animals in the forest joined in his singing too. Pip started to notice that the other animals had joined in with him singing. Pip's singing was contagious and it spread joy in his melodies wherever he went. So as you can imagine, Pip began to feel much better and in fact was feeling like his old self all over again. The feeling of sadness had passed and he realised that even when things are tough, even when things seem hard, they will always get better. And he realised that even when things seemed difficult, tough and maybe even hard, they would always get better. But not just that, there is always something to be grateful for. He realised that even though sometimes things can get tough, there is always something to be happy about. And he was happy in that moment that he had spoken with the owl because it just made him feel a little bit more hopeful. And with that hope, he had faith that even if he didn't feel like singing, he was going to do it anyway. And in doing it anyway, he spread joy and in doing so, and hearing the other animals join in singing with him, he then became to know that no matter how he was feeling, he could still spread joy and find happiness in there somewhere. So just as the owl had said to Pip, it's perfectly okay and it's perfectly normal to feel sad sometimes. It's perfectly okay and it's perfectly normal to find things difficult or a little bit hard or difficult to understand maybe why things are happening sometimes. But regardless of that, it is important to remember that that will pass. Understanding will come. The night will soon turn into day and things will improve and your happiness and your joy will always return. So after hearing Pip's story, how do you feel about things that you find difficult sometimes? The way that you think about situations that you find difficult sometimes. If you remember in the story, Pip decided, even though he didn't feel like doing what he usually did, which was singing, he said, well, I'm gonna go and fly. So he didn't sit there in that feeling. He decided to do something else. And something that we can do is go for a walk. We can't fly, but we can definitely go for a walk. Getting outside, doing something different, changing your scenery or your environment can definitely help when you may not be feeling great about anything. Also, Pip spoke to someone, he spoke to the owl. And in turn, the owl listened to what Pip's concerns were, listened to how Pip was feeling, and was able to tell Pip, it's okay. There's absolutely nothing wrong with how you're feeling. In fact, because good and bad are labeled with specific emotions and the ways that we feel, we automatically feel even worse because we're having a so-called bad emotion. The truth is, it's an emotion. It's neither good nor bad. It's just a feeling and it will pass. It may not pass as quickly as you would want it to all the time, but it will. And that is what you need to remember. So if there are things that you can do to make that move along and pass a bit quicker, that is the key. 
So take some advice from Pip. And anytime you're feeling as if you're just not feeling yourself, you just don't feel like doing the things you usually do, remember that it's okay. And also implement other things to help. Go for a walk, talk to somebody that you trust. A very powerful tool, which may seem challenging to begin with, is to write about whatever you can think of to still be happy and grateful about, even though you're feeling the way that you're feeling. And a few questions that, that can help you with making such a list are, has it helped you to come up with any new solutions? Has it taught you anything new about yourself that you didn't already know? Maybe you've noticed a new quality or a strength within you that you didn't even realise was there. That is something to be exceptionally proud about. Has it changed how you look at things on a whole? Are you able to have more compassion or empathy for a situation or a person or yourself than maybe you did before? And another one could be, what things did you do or try or implement into your life to help those feelings pass quicker? And because of doing them, have they been something that you would more likely do consistently moving forward because of how much they helped? So Angel students, I hope you enjoyed today's story about Pip and the Owl. And remember, that no matter how you may be feeling today, doesn't mean that that's how you have to feel tomorrow. Use your tools and go back to previous videos where we've spoken about journaling, gratitude list, and so on, to find other ways and techniques that can help pass those feelings quicker. Thank you, angel students. Goodbye. Hi everyone, it's a video for angel school. And uh, follow me and let's do some exercise for the joints first. Wrist and ankles. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, change. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight. Exercise your knee joints. One, all the way down. Two, three, four, five. Change. One, two. Three, change. One, two, three. Relax your hands. One, two, three, four, five. Change. One, two, three. Four, five, elbow arm, hands reach out as far as you can. One, two, three, four, five, six. Change one, two, three, four, five, six. Slightly bend your knees, follow your elbow like that. One, two, three, four, five. Things. Arm strength, relax your shoulders. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Change. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Shoulders down, heads up, neck. One, slowly. Two. 
two, three, change, one, two, three, okay, follow me and relax your back, ten times, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, yeah, let's practice uh, one basic punch first for warm up. Clench your fist, elbow back, and look where you punch. One, slowly breathing in through your nose. Two, feel the movement. Three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, let the power, one, <coughs> breathing out, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, inhale, hands on, and exhale. Let's do a quick stretch. Marble three and a half foot wide. Bend your knee, push your knee up. Breathe in, look forward. Breathe in, out, take your body. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten. Good. Let's practice one more stretch. Kung Fu. Second Kung Fu stance. One leg bent, one leg straight. One. Refill stretch. Focus on your breathing. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight, nine, ten, change. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten. Good. So the first Kung Fu stance, your both leg bent. Second stance, one leg bent, one leg straight. We can practice ten times. So keep your face on your waist, bend your knees a little bit. One, change to the side. Two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You can do exactly the same with the punch. So first cross, then punch. So when you go left, you punch your left hands. And when you go right, you punch your right hand. So ten times. Block. One. Block. Two. Block. Three. Block. Four. Block. Five. Block. Six. Block. Seven. 
So we did another punch as well last time. So this time elbow and block and punch. This time when you go left, you punch your right hand, left hand block, right hand punch. Yeah. When you go right, your right hand block, left hand punch. Let's do ten times. Elbow one. Two elbow, two elbow, three elbow, four elbow, five elbow, six elbow, seven elbow. Do quick stretch, slightly bend your knees, one foot forward, lean forward from your hips till you feel your hamstring stretch. When you feel stretch, focus on your breathing. Use your breathing to stretch. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, change. Then forward from your hands. One, when you feel stretch, focus on your breathing. Two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, feet together. Try use your both hands touch the floor ten times. One. Do the first kick, down pedal, facing your waist, and kick your right leg, right hand, touch your shoes. Ten times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, let's practice five breathing together. Start two foot point. One, two, keep your foot point straight. Foot down, head up, tailbone back in, shoulders relax. Arm straight, finger straight. Turn your hands. Breathing in through your nose. Collecting all the good energy into your body. And breathing out. 
Relax your shoulders, elbow, hands pushing down. And then use your hands to touch the floor. One more time. Breathing in through your nose. And breathing out through your nose. And three more times. Enjoy the movement. One. Feel the movement. Two. Last one. Three. Okay, let's finish here today. Please like and subscribe so you could get more and more lessons.